Hello, my name is James McCullough. I'm joining you today from Blessed John Henry Newman's own rooms in the Birmingham Oratory. And I'm speaking with Father Richard Duffield, who is the ex-provost of the Birmingham Oratory and currently is the superior of the York Oratory in formation. So thank you very much for taking the time to thank speak you. with us today, Father. Um, I'd like to start our talk just by uh, referring back to St. Philip Nere. And I would like to ask you to what extent Newman was influenced by St. Philip's own mission and how was that reflected in his work? Well, Newman had heard of St. Philip long before he became a Catholic because we see him writing about how his friend John Keeble, a famous Anglican clergyman and hymn writer, was very much like St. Philip in his spirit, his spirit of friendliness and uh, approachability, his sense of fun. Um, but it was only when he went to Rome to study to be a priest at Cardinal Wiseman, or then Bishop Wiseman's insistence, he actually discovered the oratory itself. He visited the Roman oratory, the Chiesa Nuova, and he went there for a meal with the fathers, and he found it very much like an Oxford college. He said, rather dramatically, annihilate the superior's wife and all the fellows of the celibate priests. It felt very much like home. Mm. But it was because the priests were living there together as friends and as colleagues, he saw it as a way in which his diverse crowd of followers who were coming with him into the church, who wanted to be priests too, mm. could carry on living together um, doing different kinds of work. Some of them were academics, some were teachers, some were pastors, some wanted to minister to the sick or to the poor. They could all live together, stay together, as they had been at Littlemore, yes. but carry on doing different things, but living together. I see. So the, the, the oratorians allowed this to happen, a certain amount of autonomy within one's work. Yes. As Newman said, it was rather like an Oxford college where different people are doing different studies and different things, but come together to eat and in those days still to pray together. Or a bit like a barrister's chambers where you have a, a group of autonomous people doing their own thing, but working very much together. The problem for Newman was, had he become a diocesan priest, well, there weren't really dioceses quite at that time anyway. Uh, they would have been living separately on different missions. Had they joined an order like the Jesuits, well, they could have been sent anywhere in the world, frankly. Mm. Even the Benedictines who lived together at that time really only ran schools or missions. The oratory meant they could live in a city, they could minister to different people, exercise different talents, but still cultivate that spirit of friendship which had brought them together. Mm. That's where Newman and St. Philip come together in a way. It's that, that way in which his mode of evangelization is through friendship. Mm -hmm. On the face of it, St. Philip and Newman are not very similar characters. In Newman can certainly seem a rather serious character, though I think in private he was very humorous. But on the surface, he's quite a serious character, whereas St. Philip was always laughing and joking. He's the saint of youth and the saint of joy. Mm -hmm. But what they both have in common is drawing people to God through friendship. Mm. Newman was forever drawing people through the force of his own personality to ask interesting questions, ask about God, coming closer to God, um, whether that's his friendship with Froude or Pusey, mm. and later on the people who actually became Catholics with him, like Ambrose St. John or Father Faber or Dalgairns. They all come to Christ through friendship. And so when much later on Newman is choosing the motto for his coat of arms uh, and he chose the phrase cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart, because without, of course, underplaying the role of logic and reason and the intellect in the process of conversion, Newman said nobody is converted by a syllogism. They're converted by the power and influence of our friends. In fact, he set the novices to try and find, he'd heard this phrase, cor ad cor loquitur, and he didn't know, he knew it was from the works of St. Francis de Sales, who was also an oratorian, mm. um, and he thought it must be in one of the obvious places, like the introduction to the devout life or the treatise on the love of God. And so the poor old novices had to read through all these books, it's not there at all. It's somewhere deep in the letters of St. Francois de Sales, yes. and uh, they, they found the, the, the motto. And we have his motto here, 
Is this um, something which is a memento of Newman himself? Yes, it was almost certainly here in his time. Most yes. of the things in this room were, not quite everything. I'm not sure who did it, but of course, he thought that his own family shield had had the hearts and, and the, um, the wavy red bar on it. Yes. Uh, but the motto was certainly his discovery, cor ad cor locritur, heart speaks to heart. So the two fitted together, the imagery and the motto, and it fitted very much with his past. Mm. And of course, above the fireplace, you can see St. Philip himself. Yes. Um, so this would have been something which, again, Newman had acquired again, himself and Newman put had placed here. in his time, yes. Then to St. Philip's left, you see Pope Leo XIII, who made Newman a cardinal in 1879. And up above, you have... Um, Maria Jaburn, who was uh, one of Newman's female converts. He had a quite a large uh, network of female converts and correspondents, and she was the woman who, uh, she went on to become a visitation nun, but before that she did lots of paintings of Newman, so quite a lot of the iconography of Newman from the period about the time of his conversion mm. was painted by her. It's interesting uh, that you say that there were a number of women involved who were uh, evangelized through Newman and converted do you think that Newman had, in some way, an appeal to feminine sensibility, to women in particular? Um, at that time, the world being a very masculine place, dominated by uh, male achievement, do you think that Newman was almost like a sort of a forerunner of reaching out to female Catholics? He certainly got on very well with women. I mean, he was. Maria Jaburn's a case in point. The mother of his friend, uh, John Bowden, who he was at university with, was a friend for life. He grew up in the rather feminine family who was very close to his sisters. Um, when he became a Catholic and started a school here at Birmingham, um, he was very keen that the school should not be like the great public schools and very masculine. He, said he, he gave equal weight, and this caused terrible problems later, it has to be said, he gave equal weight to the headmaster and the matron right. because they both had authority. He wanted a, mo a mother figure and the father figure. Well, later on, of course, Father Flanagan, who was the headmaster, found this conflict of authority intolerable and it did cause trouble. But what you say about the importance of the, of the influence of the feminine was very much there in him, I think. Yes. Mm. Mm. So let's now move back to uh, Newman's own work and uh, in particular his work in Birmingham. So he arrives here. Um, initially, though, was there any reluctance, do you think, of Newman to be sent to an industrial part of the United Kingdom? I don't think it was quite what he was expecting. He wrote in the letter, Oxford is a centre, London is a centre, Brummagen is no centre. Um, and I think Pope Pius IX wasn't quite sure what he was doing. He, I think his idea was that the, the, the great industrialists were all living in the middle of Birmingham. So in fact, they all lived in their great houses outside Birmingham and the ordinary people lived here. Um, but it was a mission to the middle classes and there were plenty of middle class people here, you know, the lawyers and the accountants. So uh, that was part of the mission. Um, I think at the beginning Newman thought that he might be working in London or in Oxford, but he settled here straight away. For the first two years, they weren't on this site at all. They were down in the city centre at Digbeth, which is a very rough area. Mm. And a lot of the work was with the seriously poor and deprived. Mm. Then they moved here in, in 1850 uh, to the rather prosperous suburb of Edgbaston. But the work with the poor didn't stop at that point. Um, they went over to um, help care for the cholera victims in one of the many cholera outbreaks that happened in the 1860s, um, continued to work with the poor in the city, especially with the Irish. There was a great shortage of priests. I mean, everybody, um, all priests, had to run parishes as well as do their educational work, their academic work. Oratories, in fact, historically in Italy, didn't have parishes. We were places where people came, they heard talks, they prayed, there were services, there was music, um, there were pilgrimages, and the parish priest did all that kind of thing. But in, in Britain, it was quite different. You carried on doing all the things that were part of your charism, but you had to run a parish as well. And so Newman did all of that. Though it must be said, most of his work was in teaching and writing and his voluminous correspondence. I and mean, one of the moving things about sitting here is we're sitting by the desk at which he wrote every day 
you know, scores of letters. And yeah. not just the letters he wrote to the correspondents, but he kept fair copies himself. The reason that we have so many of his letters is he made copies of his own letters. We didn't get them all back from the correspondents, but he wrote a copy for his own archive. That's remarkable. Um, so he must be writing constantly yes. at this desk. Yes, and, and, and writing well into the night, probably. Yes. And one of these people who maybe could survive on little sleep. Yes, I mean, he was, a, he was a natural writer. He had to write. He said he prayed with his pen in his hand. He prayed best with the pen in his hand. That's why his prayers, the, the, often, often the Newman prayers we're familiar with, like, may he support us all the day long with this troubled life and the shadows lengthen, and evening comes. It was written as a sermon. It's the peroration of one of his Anglican sermons, and he was praying with a pen in his hand. That's remarkable. So, moving forward slightly now, um, Newman is appointed a cardinal, and how did this come about, and what impact did it have on him? Well, when he was made a cardinal by Pope Leo XIII up there in 1879, Newman said, the shadow is lifted from me forever. Uh, and the shadow, I think, was the sense he always had that he was suspect suspect by the Anglicans he'd left behind, mm -hmm. suspect by the Catholics he'd joined, that he brought with him a spirit of Anglican liberalism or the old Oxford patristic spirit of which people were somewhat suspicious. Um, so he, I think he felt there was a bit of a cloud over him. The cloud began to lift when, in 1864, he wrote the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, his autobiography. That yes. was a bestseller but it also helped his reputation in the church. And from then on, with the establishment of the Catholic University and, and, and his work there, his reputation became you know, improved. And then with the election of Pope Leo XIII, who had followed his work from afar, mm. uh, one of the first things he did as Pope was to make Newman a cardinal. And what was the main impact of his time as a cardinal? Well, once he was a cardinal, of course, all his writings carried the kind of weight and authority of a cardinal. It, mm. it, it really gave authority to all his writings, not just his writings as a Catholic, but the writings he'd done as an Anglican as well. He'd already published retractions of things which he knew were erroneous. Mm. Um, so his sermons, the apologia itself, the development of doctrine above all, uh, which to some people looked as if you were saying that doctrine could change. That's very far from what Newman is saying. Uh, but those theories then, they become authoritative because the Pope has made this man a cardinal. It gave him authority, I would say. And is there any sign of a reconciliation with the Anglican hierarchy as an, a result of his appointment? There were always close relations with um, the people who had been his, well, I say always, to begin with, there was a certain froideur between Newman and Keeble and Pusey. But later on, they corresponded again. Newman went to visit Keeble. Um, he wrote a lot of letters to Pusey about, um, about devotion to Our Lady, uh, which forms you know, the heart of Newman's Mariology and becomes an, an essential part of the Mariology of the Catholic Church in the 20th century. Newman gives a very clear and precise account of how Marian doctrine and devotion develops in the Catholic Church. Um, puts Pusey right when he says there are certain excesses and, mm. and indeed says there are some excesses which do need to be trimmed a bit. Yes. So that corresponds that those friendships continued. I would say not so much with the hierarchy of the Anglican Church, but certainly with his friends, with his family and mm. his friends, okay. there was reconciliation. Yes, because there were originally some big rifts even with his own even family. Even with his own family, yes. 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 It never really healed with Francis Newman. So uh, I was referring to the reconciliation with the Anglican hierarchy. I was thinking along the lines of that there was some opposition to him during the Achille trial from the more evangelical uh, Protestants. Uh, did this in any way cease later on in his life? Yes, well, the, the, the apologia put yeah. paid to all of that. Um, the, the apologia came about as a result of Kingsley's attack on him. Uh, he was, Kingsley, of course, the professor of history at Cambridge. In a review of Froude's history of the church, he said that uh, Catholics um, do not think truth is a virtue for its own sake, and then went on to say, Dr. Newman informs us of this. And of course, 
Newman was very keen to that. Catholics do think truth is a virtue for its own sake. Newman, Kingsley was saying that Newman had been kind of prevaricating and had been a secret Catholic within the Anglican Church, had, had, had hidden his true motives and meaning. Uh, and so Newman set out to write his spiritual autobiography in order to show that at every stage of his life he'd been completely open and honest uh, about what he believed and hadn't been trying to deceive anybody as, the, as if there had been some great plot to draw people into the kind of the secrets of, of Romanism. And so um, there was a correspondence of a, you know, um, half a dozen letters and pamphlets between Newman and Kingsley and then in the end Newman decided the only thing to do was to write the whole history down. So he wrote it in serial form. He was writing for a deadline every week between February and April 1864. He dug out all his archives, all the letters, all the letters from friends, his diaries, um, the remembered conversations and um, his own writings to show exactly uh, what he'd been thinking and teaching at the time. He said, as he wrote, sometimes up to 18 hours a day, the tears were in his eyes. He remembered the people, mm. his correspondents, some of whom had died. Um, and as soon as it was written and published, people could see this was a man bearing his soul. Mm. And the honesty mm. of it was evident. And of course, some of the evidence was in the public domain anyway, because there were sermons and books he'd published. And so yes. clearly you know, what he was showing was that he'd been teaching and preaching the truth, uh, certainly as he believed it then, and, and it was a natural journey. So he, he suffered quite a lot in his life, um, not so much physically, although he was very ill during his tour of Italy, but more about the loss of his connections. Yes, I think he always suffered from the loss of his friends, of the distance of his friends. I think he needed strong emotional bonds and contacts. He valued friendship very highly, but I think he valued truth more. And so when he felt obliged, one reason, I think he was convinced of the truth of the Catholic Church by certainly the early 1840s, if not the late 1830s. Um, he was anxious that if he moved too quickly, lots of people would move with him when they weren't ready. Um, the effect that would have on people, the effect it would have on his friendships. He tried to find a way of avoiding the step, which he knew was inevitable. But one of the things he was anxious not to happen was for him to lose his friends. And he did, of course, lose them for a while, some of them always, but in fact, most of them, the friendships were restored. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about the years leading up to his death? He was living here and using this very room. Yes, he became increasingly infirm. He didn't go out a great deal. Um, but uh, and this, this, this room was his room from 1850 till his death in 1890. To begin with, um, he would occupy the whole room just as one might occupy one study. When he was made a cardinal in 1879, one of the rules of being cardinal was you had to have your own chapel. Well, really, you had to reside in Rome. You had to have a dispensation from the Pope to reside away from Rome if you were not the bishop of an Episcopal see. And the Pope said, yes, you may reside in Birmingham, but you must have your own Cardinal's Chapel. So just over there, you may be able to film it later, is Newman's private chapel. So his room was divided in two. He got his own bedroom, finally. His bed would have been in there. Um, and um, he had a place where he could say Mass. And if you can film it, there's a lovely uh, series of photographs by the altar of all his friends from his Catholic and Anglican life, so he could remember them during Mass. He just had to turn his head. But no, he, he, he kept all his books here. The, the, behind me is the uniform edition of his works, the works of reference. You've seen the library where the great yes. library of the fathers are, the, the, the big library. Um, and, and he wrote and read in here. He would have seen people down in the parlour, probably down at the front of the house. Uh, our, our rooms are our cells in a way. We don't bring yes. people very much to them, but... This was his place of work and thoughts and prayer and writing. Let's take a quick look at his chapel. Yes. Here we are at Cardinal Newman's own rooms, and it hasn't changed apparently since his death. No, it's been left pretty much as it was the day he died. Uh, no electricity or no electric electricity, lighting? No, the only thing we've done is put some curtains in to stop the light damaging the books. Right. Well, let's have a look. So that's a desk at which he wrote so many, almost all his vast correspondence from the time he moved into this room in 1850. Yes. The small lamp was given to him by the Prime Minister Gladstone. They had a correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, 
after papal infallibility about the loyalty of Catholics to the state. Right. Uh, Newman wants to make sure that uh, Gladstone understood that Catholics could be loyal Englishmen, so they had the correspondence. This is quite interesting. This is a, a rather falling apart uh, newspaper cutting uh, showing General Gordon's route to Khartoum in 1884. Now, Newman didn't know this at the time. He was just interested in the campaign mm. Um, mm. and in, in, in Gordon's work. Um, but he didn't know that Gordon had with him a copy of the Dream of Derontius, which he read all the time and wrote notes in the margin. After Gordon was shot in Khartoum, uh, his copy of the Dream was sent back to Newman. We have it here. This is Predia here, where he would say the rosary each day. Here are his rosaries. Yes. When Pope Benedict came here, um, we brought him here to, to pray and, and to see these things, and uh, we planned to give him a rosary. So I just said, here, this Holy Father, this one is for you. The church he had as a cardinal, every cardinal, of course, in theory, is a parish priest or a deacon, in Newman's case, of a Roman church. And then his chapel is certainly worth having a look at. Prior to 1879, this would have been his bedroom, but then it became his chapel. It's dedicated to St. Francis de Sales, from whom he got his cardinal's motto, Cor ad Cor Loquitur. When he was made a cardinal, he was presented with a set of vestments by the um, English-speaking community resident in Rome. The um, inscription relating to them is up here. To His Eminence Cardinal Newman, we are devoted English, Scotch, Irish and American children at present residing in Rome etc etc that's well, remarkable it has they, the motto on and the coat of arms the coat of arms is there that's fantastic there's one in each of the liturgical colors so he would presumably have used these for his daily mass and the lives of the saint here of saint francis de sales done for him by maria Giburn from france oh, by yes. that time she yes. was a visitation nun herself and then his chalices are in these boxes that one, I think, is a replica of St. Philip's Chalice. That's remarkable. And another one here. What a privilege to be able to see these, to have them still here. And if you're able, perhaps later on, to get a shot of the, his cardinal's chair, it has the coat of arms on the back and his motto, Cor ad Cor Locutor. Pope Benedict knelt here and prayed when he visited here at the time of the beatification in 2013. So, Father Richard, looking at Newman's life, would you say he is an apologist, or is he an evangelist, or was his main mission to be with the poor, or was he an educator, or a mix of all? A bit of all of it. Um, an apologist, certainly, because he gives a kind of intellectual weight to the faith. An evangelist too, but not in quite the normal way. I mean, he's not out there you know, preaching on the street corners, or even he doesn't even have a very big apostolate in terms of you know, what one might have magazines or articles. But by by personal contact, again, always by personal contact. That that voluminous correspondence with people who were in doubt, and he he answered all their questions painstakingly, slowly, and at length, and so people could read both the doubts that people brought to him and Newman's answers. Um, and although I wouldn't say that the work with the poor was his main work here, the fathers, the fathers of the community were doing that work, right. Newman was doing more writing and preaching and teaching, um, but it was certainly a work of the community. Um, but one of Newman's last acts as a cardinal, um, in 1890, the year he died, in January, there was a dispute at the Cadbury's factory. The Catholic workers there were being obliged to attend Quaker prayers, which was, of course, against their Catholic faith. So Newman went over to Cadbury's and spoke to the Cadbury's and said, um, please let the Catholics have their own prayer, or at least be excused the Quaker prayers, and that was granted. That's so, wonderful. So tell us briefly about his death. Well, he died on August the 11th, 1890, not in this room, but in the room next door, which had become his bedroom. He'd been quite infirm for some time. He was able to celebrate Mass until the last few months, but then that became possible. He was brought communion here, and you know, the fathers came and said the De Profundis by his bed, and, and uh, so he, he died quite peacefully. And his funeral? Well, thousands of people turned up to line the route. Um, um, the church, he, he lay in state in the church, not the church as you see it now, because that was built as a memorial after his death. Um, 
but it was a great kind of occasion for the people of Birmingham as well because he'd become greatly loved. Yes. He was our cardinal. And he had missions throughout the city and outside the city. Yes, well, they, so they, they'd, they'd had other churches. He was well known. He was a great friend of uh, Bishop Ullathorne and the subsequent mm. bishops of Birmingham. Yes, oh, That's fantastic. So what would you say is his legacy and how is it able to reach out to people today? I think his legacy is he, he's, he's very well known. People have heard of Cardinal Newman. And I think as soon as you start to read him, this certainly happened to me, you're hooked. And different people will be hooked by different things. I'm hooked by his sermons. When you read his sermons, they're models of, a, of, 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 of preaching on the gospel, um, bringing in what the fathers of the church have written, bringing in the whole history of the church. His poetry too, The Dream of Gerontius. Mm -hmm. Your more academic, philosophical types will be brought in by reading the grammar of a sense. Um, and reading the Apologia, it, it's like reading one of the great works of, of, of the Victorian writers. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. the, the sheer wonder of the style. But his letters are also wonderful to read. You know, it's re reading his letters, um, the, the personal contact, always back to the personal contact. But I think you have to make your own personal contact with him. But there are so many points of entry. Well, I think that with his motto, Cor ad cor loquitur, that that is maybe the main message, is personal contact. Yes, it's what we can do. We can use our friendships to draw people to Christ in the church. Indeed. Father Richard, thank you very much for your thank time you. and for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you.